2 Kings chapter 18, verses 17 through 37. 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 17 says, And the king of Assyria went, sent Tartan and Arabsarts and Rabshakeh from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem, and when they were come up, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is in the highway of the fuller's field. And when they had called to the king, there came out to them Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, which was over the household, and Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. And Rabshakeh said unto them, Speaking out of Hezekiah, thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? Thou sayest, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt unto all that trust on him. But if you say unto me, we trust in the Lord our God, is not that he whose high places, whose, whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away? And I said to Judah and Jerusalem, ye shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Now therefore I pray thee, give pledges to my Lord, the king of Assyria, and I will deliver thee two thousand horses, if thou be able on thy part to set riders upon them. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants, and put thy trust in Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Am I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, Go up against this land and destroy it. Then said Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna, and Joah, unto Rabshakeh, Speak, I pray thee, to thy servants in the Syrian language, for we understand it, and talk not with us in the Jews' language, in the ears of the people that are on the wall. But Rabshakeh said unto them, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men which sit on the wall, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language, and spake, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria." Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and then eat ye every man of his own vine, and every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one of the waters of his cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of oil, olive, and of honey, that ye may live and not die. And hearken not to Hezekiah when he persuadeth you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and of Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hena, and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of mine hand? Who are they among all the gods of the countries they have delivered their country out of mine hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? But the people held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was saying, Answer him not. Then came Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, to Hezekiah with their clothes rent, and told him the words of Rabshakeh. Have you ever been intimidated by the way someone spoke to you? Or conversely, have you ever been intimidating to others by the way you spoke to them? Sometimes people can say things that just get under your skin. Former NBA player Michael Jordan is considered, widely considered, the best to ever play the game. Six NBA championships, five regular season MVPs, three all-star MVPs, and one Olympic gold medals, one Olympic gold medal, he certainly has the credentials to be considered one of the all-time greats. Now, his athletic ability to one side, he's also widely considered to be the one of the best trash talkers to ever play. Getting into his opponent's heads with comments about exactly how he was going to score on on them. They couldn't guard him. They had no chance, etc. And for the most part, he was right. He walked the talk. Trash talking is a tactic. Getting an opponent, opponent off their game, not physically, but just getting in their heads a little bit. Trash talking is pretty much expected in sports, and even between friends, it can be a way of joking and having fun. Shake an opponent's confidence by making them fear or even believe 
they will be defeated. 2 Kings chapter 18, the people of Judah find themselves in a situation where their confidence is being attacked. While Sennacherib had certainly tried to do that earlier with his deception, this attack was different because it was entirely a war of words. Earlier lesson, we discovered Hezekiah came back from a mistake, prepared himself and his people for a serious attack against Jerusalem. In 2 Kings chapter 18, as they waited for the enemy to attack, they were approached by some of, Sennach- some of Sennacherib's messengers led by a nam- man named Rabshakeh. Sets himself up in a place where the people could see and hear him. Instead of offering news of peace or further compromise, he strategically and skillfully mocks them and begins to intimidate them. Rabshakeh said unto them, speaking now to Hezekiah, thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is this wherein thou hast trustest? He delivers a speech with the goal of making the people afraid. Think back, though, how this speech contrasts to an earlier one we looked at from Hezekiah to his people earlier wanting to instill confidence and strength, speaking faith into them. Instead of feeling powerful, the people felt panic. Could they believe what Hezekiah had told them, that God was going to give them the victory over Assyria? Or would they believe the enemy's words and the massive Assyrian army that was backing him up? We're up against it. Our faith is tested. We're bombarded with lies and feelings of discouragement, fear, insecurity, condemnation. How do you combat the lies voices tell you that are meant to shake your confidence and test your faith? in God. Determine which voice you will listen to. Right voices lead to right choices. If you listen to the voices of fear, it is meant to break you and make you doubt yourself and your God. Choose to hear and focus on the voice of truth that comes from God's word and from people he places in your life to guide you in the right direction. We're going to look, your, you'll notice your papers look a little different this time. They don't have like an outline with points and subpoints. Lie and the truth the lie and the truth. We'll look at common lies from the enemy and that the truth voices that we should be listening to. Lie is your past will haunt you forever. Your past will haunt you forever. Rabshakeh starts by basically attacking Hezekiah's past mistakes. We already know and had a lesson about his stealing from God's house to pay Assyria. But from our text in 2 Kings chapter 18, Rabshakeh brings up another mistake, verses 19 through 21. Rabshakeh said unto them, Speaking now to Hezekiah, thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou hast trustest? Thou sayest, but they are but vain words, I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt unto all that trust on him. Hezekiah made an allegiance with Egypt and another country that Israel had no business, Judah had no business dealing with. Rabshakeh mocks the deal that Judah had made. Egypt was not a strong nation. It was not a reliable nation ally, calling them a bruised reed or a weak stick that wouldn't be able to support Judah. And by and large, Rabshakeh was right. Hezekiah had made another mistake by putting and putting his people at risk. But Rabshakeh was wrong, implying that the mistake was permanent or unrecoverable. The lie is your past will haunt you forever. The truth is that your past doesn't define you. Your past doesn't define you. The enemy wants you to believe your past mistakes are who you are. You can never get past them, bringing guilt and condemnation. The truth, though, God can take your mistakes and make them miracles. We accept salvation. He remembers our sin no more. There is no reminder of past mistakes, only grace, forgiveness, love, and peace. It's been said before, Satan brings up your past, remind him of his future. 
Revelation 20.10, the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night, forever and ever. That's his end. That's what he has to look forward to. He wants to bring up the past. Well, your future doesn't look so bright, Satan. Remember that. The lie. You are powerless. You are powerless. So he, Rabshakeh reminds Hezekiah of his mistakes. He then, turn, he then turns to taunting the people of Israel. Again, from 2 Kings chapter 18, and verse 23, Now therefore I pray thee, give pledges to my lord the king of Assyria, and I will deliver thee 2,000 horses, if thou be able on thy part to set riders upon them. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants, and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? He tells them if the king of Assyria straight up gives them 2,000 horses, they don't even have enough trained riders to use them. It's at this point that some of Hezekiah's men steps in, like him. They could see the impact that Rabshakeh's words were having on the people. They tried to kind of slow him down by asking him to speak in the Syrian language, what they could understand, but the people couldn't. He ignores them and speaks even louder and intent on intimidating the people from verse 28. Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and spake, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. His message was loud and clear. You're weak, you're small, you don't have a chance. The lie is you are powerless. The truth is you can make a difference. You can make a difference. Maybe in your life you've tried to silence the voice of the enemy only to hear it get louder instead. You've tried to do what's right and tune out wrong influences, but it seems like it's harder than ever, and nothing you can do will help. Satan wants you to believe that no matter what you do, you cannot make a difference. The truth is, is, as a child of God, you don't have to rely on your own power. You draw on the Holy Spirit of God Almighty, the creator of the universe. And with this power, you can make a difference. And I think of great power it must take to make a difference. It must take incredible power. But notice what Jude, verse 22 says, and of some having compassion, making a difference. Wow. Well, compassion doesn't sound very strong. Uh, I think we'd be surprised at the strength there is in compassion. I, that's not, compassion, not one of my strong points. I don't have a lot of compassion for people. I tend to first jump to someone struggling, someone having a hard time, yeah, you kind of made your own bed. Yeah, you kind of did this to yourself. I think, though, I'm pretty thankful that God didn't tell me, well, you're a sinner. You've kind of made your own bed. You will suffer the consequences because you kind of did this to yourself. No, God had and has on a daily basis still with me as compassion. I want to make a difference have compassion. God's ability to use you is not dependent on what people think. It's about what God says we are capable of. He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. The lie, you can't trust God. You can't trust God. He just keeps going in 2 Kings chapter 18. I, Brad Jacob is on a roll here. Verse 29, Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Now he attacks their faith. Don't listen to Hezekiah. He's deceiving you. Don't let him tell you the Lord will save you. That's what you're trusting in. What he says, the Lord will fight for you. Doubt is a very common tactic. Why? Because it works. 
it's effective, unfortunately. What's the first thing Satan, the serpent, suggests to Eve? Doubt. Hath God said? Is that what he meant, really, Eve? The first thing, doubt. It's been said many times we have to experience doubt to learn the truth for ourselves. We must pass through the foyer of doubt in order to enter the sanctuary of certainty. Remember, God's not about doubting. He's about knowing. Knowing, yeah, I, I really am nothing. It is all him. I really am useless. But God can use me. Get a few people just to doubt and fear, Rabshakeh knew. That's the thing about doubt also, is it's, it's contagious. Negativity, the things that you don't want spreading like wildfire, usually spread like wildfire. Ru untrue rumors, doubt, fear. Negativity. <laughs> the stuff you want, positivity, the truth, doesn't spread like doubt, fear. Negativity. Rumors do. Get just a few people to doubt and fear, Rabshakeh knew that would spread. So the fear, the lie is you can't trust God. The truth is you can't trust God fully. Many times, like I said, we have to experience doubt to learn the truth for ourselves. God is fully trustworthy. He never fails. Don't let doubt deter you. It's not a sin to doubt. Unfortunately, it tends to be human nature. Doubting Thomas, I mean, that's basically his name. That's what people know him by. So doubt will come. Doubt will creep in and think, well, you realize, like, physically that's not possible. You realize that really can't happen, right? The way the culture is today, the way people are today, you can't reach them that way. That's really, that just not, doesn't work anymore. God's word isn't the same as it was thousands of years ago. Don't let it deter you. Doubt can develop you, can build your faith, can drive you back to your knees and back to God. Praise God for his faithfulness. Joshua 21.45 says, There failed not aught of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel. All came to pass. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 56, Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel according to all that he promised. There hath not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. It's not a 50-50 thing with God, whether he's going to succeed, whether, whether what he said will happen or not. Eh, you, you never know. It can, a lot of things come into play here. It could change. That's not God. What he said, he will do. You can trust God fully. Trust is not an easy thing. We tend to base how we feel, faith even, if you will, on circumstances and what we can actually see. When many times God is not about what you can see. It's what you have faith in. So it's not an easy thing. I'm not saying that's yeah, a piece of cake to trust God creator of the universe your mind knows there is no reason you should ever doubt him but we do we I don't, we just we we loved i don't know we almost love to doubt it seems like we almost enjoy it we do it so much but you can the truth is you can trust god fully. 
What is the lie? God's plan, following God's plan, leads to misery. So Rab Shekha here in 2 Kings chapter 18 wasn't done. Verse 31. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and then eat ye every man of his own vine, and every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one the waters of his cistern, until I come out, I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of oil, olive, and of honey, that ye may live and not die. And hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuadeth you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. What I have for you is right in front of you. You can see it. How much does the devil use that? It's right in front of you. See? I See the job? Great pay? You can buy pretty much whatever you want. But no, you just want to go on in your little faith and faith and trusting God will take care of it and take care of you. Yeah, you do that. Look what I have. It's right in front of you. You can see it, touch it, smell it, hear it. He tells them they would be much better off surrendering to Assyria than hanging around Hezekiah, listening to what he says about following God's plan. Even telling them they would prosper. Eating of their own vine, their own fig tree, of their drinking water from their own cistern. We'll take you to a land it's just like your land. Land of corn and wine, bread and vineyards, oil, olive, and of honey. You may live and not die. Assyria did not want to help Judah. They had no intention of taking them to a land just like the one they're in. Or a land they may have envisioned as a promised land. They wanted to destroy them. The devil never wants to help us. Never. Regardless of what he presents, regardless of what he says. He is not looking out for our best interest. He looks out for his own best interest. His best interest is distract, deter, discourage, defeat, devour. It's a lot of D's. That's what his intent is. Not to help. Not to make you prosper. He wants to destroy the children of God. He wants to tell us that following God's plan will only bring misery compared to what he offers us. Everyone else is having fun. You're miserable. And if you abandon God's plan, great things will happen. No wonder God says there is no truth in him. He is the father of lies. If he can't tell the truth. It's like the Bible says, God cannot lie. I believe the, the converse is true. Satan cannot tell the truth. He can't. There is no truth in him. He is the father of lies. Satan's lies are a trap, only bringing heartache, disappointment, destruction. What's the truth? Following God's plan brings true joy. Following God's plan brings true joy. How many self-help help books, if you will, have been written and sold trying to help others discover the secret to life's happiness? There's no real big mystery here. Finding lasting joy. The problem is most people go looking for it in the wrong place. And almost invariably, you will find people, and I found myself going to this place myself, convincing ourselves that if we just had a little bit more, 
we would be a lot happier. If I don't have to become so close to the end of the month and not have any money, just a little bit more to keep the bills paid, just a little, a little bit more, I would be so much happier. We always make it about the, seemingly about the physical. Alexander the Great thought he could achieve happiness through military might, and he essentially conquered the known world of his day. Toward the end of his life, he cried in his tent because there were no more worlds to conquer. Lord Byron, the 19th century poet, lived a life of excess, numerous love affairs, racking up huge debts for his life of pleasure and leisure. At the end of his relatively short life, he was far from happy, writing this line in a poem on his birthday, The worm, the canker, and grief are mine alone. So if happiness can't be found in wealth, fame, pleasure, then where does it come from? Well, the truth is, serving God and following His plan and purpose for your life brings true joy and satisfaction. Far too many people think that God is out to get us. He's vengeful. He's sending people to hell. He has an agenda, agenda to those he wants a vengeful repayment to those he feels have slighted him. Our God wants the very best for his children. He's not willing that any should perish. Do you think heaven is big enough, has room enough to have every single person in it that's ever been born throughout the history of time? Absolutely. It could. But it won't be that way. But he still has and wants the very best for us. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. So, when he says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, that must mean there's at least times when I don't know, or when I doubt that. I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Peace, not evil. Well, Lord, help me to have that mind then. Help me to think like you do. Help me to understand it's not going to be easy. But he does want peace for us. He does not want evil. Following God's plan brings true joy. Not necessarily happiness. Happiness is too far, way too often based on circumstances. Where you're at in life. How much you have. God is about joy. And sometimes it feels like I need more strength just to get through days. I need more strength to understand what's going on with me physically or whatever it might be. But the Bible says the joy of the Lord and I'm going to insert a word here is supposed to be my strength. Now, supposed to be is not in there. The Lord of the Lord is my strength. So it is about what he has, how he thinks, his purpose. Lord, help me to see that because pretty much whatever I come up with is going to be the opposite. I don't think the way he does. My thoughts aren't his thoughts. His ways are not my ways. Help me understand, what are your ways then, Lord? Help me, to, help me to go there first. Help me to go to compassion first instead of, eh, there you go, made your own bed. Because that's how he thinks. Lord, help me to even tap into then 
the joy of the Lord when we need strength. And I think sometimes, and I, found, I, I think to myself this way at times when I ask for strength, I, I believe there's, there's two different things at play here, but many times what needs to be strengthened is my faith. I don't need strength to do something physically. I don't need strength to go lift heavy weights or, no, Lord, I just increase my faith. That is going to make me stronger. With faith, there is strength. Well, Lord, if your thoughts toward me are thoughts of peace, help me to have those thoughts. Help me to think about that. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things, that whole list. Think on these things. The lie, you can't win. You can't win. Rabshakeh saved for what he thought was the most important part of his speech to Judah for the last. After telling the people they couldn't trust God or Hezekiah and that being ruled by Assyria was in their best interest, he ends with this in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 33. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and of Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hena, and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of mine hand? Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of mine hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of mine hand? Might as well give up now, Judah. Look at all the other nations we've conquered. Their gods couldn't save them. Yours can't save you. You can't stop us. You can't win. And remember, in actuality, the Assyrian army was no joke. They weren't a bunch of weak, mealy mouth personnel. There have been archaeological findings of Sennacherib's writings, and in them is an account of having destroyed 46 walled cities and taken over 200,000 captives. No small thing here. We're not talking about an easily defeated army. Formidable army. Everything points to a certain Assyrian victory. Judah would just be another defeated statistic. The truth, though, you are victorious in Christ. So this last Rabshakian, if you will, taunt was saved for last, probably because he thought it would be the most effective. He knew that when people lose all hope of victory, they are truly conquered. In the same way, Satan uses this lie that you can't win to destroy your hope of ever overcoming sin and temptation. Whatever you struggle with, he wants you convinced no one has ever beat it, no one has ever conquered it, so you really have no chance either. He wants us broken, ready to give up. Remember, though, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The the best day of Satan is still not even close to a match for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Rabshakeh was right when he said no other nation's God could save them, but he didn't count on Judah's God being the Lord God Almighty. In In Jehovah God's hands, Judah was already victorious. The truth is, we don't have to be afraid of any enemy, and we do not have to be a slave to sin. Romans 8, 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Well, Lord, help me understand what a more than a conqueror is. I just want to beat it. But I'm supposed to be more than that. I can be more than a conqueror, oh, through him that loved us. So it's through the Lord, oh. Yeah, that's a pretty big condition. Not through me, not what I come up with, what I think is right. It's him. So after his long-winded speech ends, the people of Judah had a lot to think about, a major decision to make. Verse 36 from our text in 2 Kings chapter 18, they answered him not a word because Hezekiah told them not to. Don't even answer him. 
He's going to come up with some, whatever he's going to say, do not answer him. So they don't. Sometimes silence is the best response. Remember Mark Twain said, it's better to keep your mouth closed and let people think you're a fool than to open it and remove all doubt. That's true a lot, unfortunately. The people were quiet on the outside, probably inside, probably a lot going along on, a lot of thoughts, a lot of voices. They're facing an enemy that was bigger, stronger, who had already started to destroy Jerusalem's surrounding cities. On one hand, they had Hezekiah trying his best to encourage them, speak faith into them, telling them that God had a plan, he would do the fighting for them. But again, so many times about what we see. What they could see was an incredibly massive Syri uh, Assyrian army. Formidable, unbeatable. They heard Rabshakeh's taunts. No matter how hard they fought, they would be next in a long line of defeated nations. Which voice would they listen to? The same choice is yours when you find yourself being intimidated by the enemy. The deceiver will tell you your situation is hopeless, you're worthless, you can never win. The voice of truth from the Holy Spirit and God's word will tell you you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139. God has wonderful plans for your life. We just read he has thoughts of peace towards you, not of evil. Jeremiah chapter 29. And through faith, the victory is already ours. Who will you believe? Which voice will you listen to?